All right. Um, so welcome to the last lecture before the exam and the spring break. So the uh, exam will be here on Wednesday, usual time as lecture. I'm actually I'm trying to get a larger room for the exam, but it doesn't look like it's working. So there might be a last minute announcement that if we're going to be somewhere else, if they give me a bigger room because this is like very crowded. Um, but unless you hear otherwise, exam will be here. Uh, if it's somewhere else, we'll, we'll also put a TA here to send you to wherever we're going to be. Um, yeah? Uh, exam is closed book. Um, the, so I have been asked a lot of things about the exam. They're all on the uh, website. Uh, you can see the policies about the exam. Uh, also, as you could see uh, on both Piazza and coursework, so it excludes this lecture and it excludes uh, the last lecture on future importances. But everything before that is up for testing. So today I want to talk about um, parameter, parameter tuning and automatic machine learning. And so we talked about many different kinds of models and all the parameters they have and many different pre-processing strategies. And today I want to talk a little bit more about more principled ways to select among these for a particular problem. Most um, sort of practical data scientists rely on their intuition and um, think about what kind of problem is this, what are the, pro uh, the properties of the data, what are uh, the properties of the algorithms that I might want to try on this. Um, I just overheard something about that someone talking about uh, how um, machine learning in some places replaces jobs and people are afraid that it's going to replace their job. The uh, idea here is to replace data scientists now with something that does it automatically. Um, so uh, we can all lie on the beach because that's how capitalism works, unfortunately not. Um, so the goal is to select among models, or along, among hyperparameters, and among preprocessing methods. So basically, um, given the supervised machine learning problem, I would like to have an algorithm that comes up with the right pipeline for me. So. I will phrase this, oh, another thing I should say, so I'm, uh, before, before I go into this, I borrow very freely from a tutorial that was given at the last NeurIPS by uh, Frank Hutter and Joaquin van, Cor van Choren, and I linked to it in the uh, class schedule. So I highly recommend you actually go and uh, look at the YouTube video, it's like one and a half hours or two hours, and it goes into much more detail to the things I'm talking about here. Um, a, because they have more time, and B, because they know this much better because it's their main area of research. So definitely go check out this video. There's also a book put together by them um, that I linked to. Particularly the first chapter of the book is an introduction to automatic machine learning by, um, written by Matthias Feurer, uh, to, uh, about whom I'll talk about later. Um, so b both of these links are really, really useful and really give a broad overview of all the things I want to talk about. So yeah, I'll encourage you to check these out. All right, so coming back to where I was. So I will phrase this as a, a problem of hyperparameter selection. And so we will think of all of these things as hyperparameters of the method. Um, so. You saw already, like in grid search CV, you can just, instead of searching over parameters, you can also search over the steps in the pipeline. So we think about whether we should use, uh, say, a neural network or an SVM just as another hyperparameter, or whether uh, we should do imputation with this method or that's this method, whether we should scale or whether sh we should um, do somewhat hot encoding. We think of all of these as hyperparameters. So now we have a really big hyperparameter space, and we want to look into the space of basically all possible machine learning pipelines and we want to pick the best one. Um, so one thing that's uh, particularly like tricky, there's several things that are tricky with these. One is the uh, presence of conditional hyperparameters. This is something that uh, you d you, we haven't really talked about much so far because usually, okay, if you have a linear model, you have a regularization parameter. If you have random forest, you have these kind of parameters in the random forest. Uh, 
But if you look at pipelines, there often are parameters that are only active, conditional, and other parameters. So if, if my parameter now is should I use a support vector machine or a random forest, then depending on which of those sele I select, I will have other conditional parameters like which kernel to use, what are the, is the kernel bandwidth, and so on. And so these parameters only uh, matter if I actually select it as a classifier. So you could think of the space of all the uh, possible pipelines as like a big cube, a big grid search product, but it's actually not the product space because some of the parameters are only active if other ones are, uh, are active. And so you already got this in, in SVMs. If you select a different kernel, like if you select a linear kernel, then gamma will be ignored. Um, if you select a polynomial kernel, then you need to specify um, the degree and so on. Um, this is something that's particularly important like if you work with pipelines because there's so you actually pick the steps and if you work with neural networks because they're very flexible. So very often you want to parameterize um, how many layers are there on the network and then you maybe want to parameterize um, how a particular layer is set up or how you learn it. But clearly only if, those, if, the fifth, if you have five layers, you need to set something for the fifth layer. So conditional hyperparameters happen a lot in neural networks. And so I'll, uh, as I'm, I'm gonna talk about more of these uh, algorithms for finding good pipelines, I'll uh, try to address how they deal with uh, this situation. So yeah, so I'll um, <coughs> formulate this as um, one big optimization uh, problem where you have one search space, you have many hyperparameters, many of them are conditional on each other. There's categorical, which is like, which models to use as a categorical, or um, then there's actually like what penalty to use or um, whether to use bootstrapping and random forest or something like this, categorical. There's many that are integers, like how deep do you want to grow the trees? And then there are continuous ones, like uh, the regularization in the linear model. Also, these have different distribution that you want to sort of um, search over or that you want to use as a prior. For example, we saw that for the kernel bandwidth in a kernel SVM, or for regularization in a linear model, you usually want to uh, search this on a log space, not on a linear space. So you could say, oh, this is between zero and 100, but it's actually, you want to look at it between zero and 100 on a logarithmic grid. If you just use a uniform distribution between zero and 100, you'll probably not get a good regularization uh, constant for a linear model. Of course, it might be something like 0.001. Okay, so this is generally called, also called the uh, cache problem, I think mostly by Frank Kutter. Uh, this is his name for this, which is the, um, my God, combined algorithm configuration. My God, I forgot what it stands for. That's not good. Um, okay, never mind. It's not so important. Uh, it's basically, uh, Searching for both the algorithm and the hyperparameters. Combined algorithm. No. God damn it. Okay, don't worry about it. But the problem is to search both over the pipeline and over the hyperparameter space. So, so far, the only thing that we basically uh, looked at for this is grid search. And um, so, whenever we wanted to tune a hyperparameter, we used um, grid search, which is basically exhaustive search or brute force search. It looks at all possible combinations or at all valid configurations if you have conditional parameters. There's two main issues with um, grid search. Um, the first one is you have to specify the grid and you have to specify uh, a resolution for the grid and so, um, and you have to specify exactly what are the points you want to draw. Try what are the hyperparameters you want to um, uh, tune. And then this is very slow as it's exponential in a number of dimensions. It's very important in grid search that you don't search over something that's not important. Let's say I search over the tolerance 
the stopping tolerance in an algorithm. That's something I've seen people do. I don't think it's very meaningful. Um, but let's say you add another parameter that doesn't do anything, and you try 10 different values for it. Your grid search will be 10 times slower. Because every time you add a parameter, um, basically the space uh, grows by a factors the number of uh, parameters you want to try. So if you have a big pipeline and you have many options in uh, each of the steps, so let's say you have like five options for imputation, five options for scaling, um, then some 10 options for pre-processing, and then five different parameters for your model, then you'll end up with something like um, five to the 10 different parameters, which is like impossible to search over. So basically what most of this um, will be about this lecture is how can we do better than just trying to do brute force search? And so first, we will look at this as a black box optimization procedure, where here, um, capital lambda is the whole configuration of the pipeline together with the hyperparameters, and uh, F means uh, building the model and evaluating on the validation set. So F is basically what happens if I run cross-validation on a given data set with um, these parameters and these models and a given metric. And what we want to find out is we want to find lambda star, which is the best configuration that gives us the best validation um, performance. So this is also called um, global optimization, so we, we have already seen uh, functions that we want to optimize, like we wanted to find um, linear coefficients to optimize like the training set loss or something in a linear model. Um, this function here is quite different because it's much, much harder to optimize. The function f here is the performance of the model given the hyperparameters. This function you can usually, uh, is non-differentiable. You, ca you can't really differentiate. Like if this is a forest, you want to have the performance of the forest given the maximum depth of the tree. Um, it's not even continuous. There's no way you could like do a gradient-based optimization method. It's not gonna be convex. It's not gonna be quadratic. It's like just an arbitrary function on a very complicated space lambda. And so solving this problem in general is uh, NP-hard. So in a sense, this is impossible to solve in all cases. However, um, we don't need to solve all cases. Uh, we hope to find something that's better than, um, than doing brute force search in like cases that are relevant to us. Also, what you should keep in mind here is that the function f is evaluating our model given these pipe of parameters. Um, the reason why we want to like, speed this up is because evaluating f is very slow. Think of f as being train a neural network for a week. But let's say every time you want to evaluate the function, it takes you a week. It is clearly like the worst case, but even if it takes you only like three hours, then you want to find an optimum by doing very, very few um, steps in this search, very few evaluations. Of course, uh, if we do a lot of evaluations, then um, we're just gonna wait forever. All right, so we're in this like, very hard setting where F is really uh, expensive to compute and we have no knowledge of what F is whatsoever and it's probably a very ugly function. So, there's a couple of ways to um, approach this. Um, one is what's called random search. This picture is actually taken from a paper by Bergstrom Bengio, which is kind of seminal now, where they show that doing a random sampling in some, sense, uh, in some settings can be much more effective than doing a grid search. And the example that's shown here is what if uh, many of the parameters don't matter? In grid search, if, as I said before, if you add a parameter, it doesn't matter, you get exponentially slower because you have to try out all, all possible combinations of the unimportant parameters. In random search, 
the idea is that um, here we have continuous distributions or continuous parameters, and we just sample from um, these um, distributions. So we don't say I'm going to go over all combinations because the space is continuous. There's impossible. There's infinitely many. So for the grid layout here, I said, okay, I have three values uh, for each of the parameter settings, that which leads to nine um, evaluations in total. Um, but the point that's depicted on the y-axis here uh, is the unimportant one, which doesn't influence the, mo uh, the outcome. The one on the x-axis is the important one. So if I do this grid layout now, what I get is I get three evaluations of the important parameter. This value, this value, and this value. And uh, so I get very low resolution on the function that I care about. If instead I draw nine samples from uh, the cross product of the continuous distribution. So basically, I look uh, at this parameter uniformly and at this parameter uniformly, and I draw uh, nine random samples. So I'm using the same budget. I get nine distinct values. And so I get nine distinct values for the important parameter. So you can see this here. So now I have much higher resolution on the important parameter. And uh, Bergstrom and Benjo show that uh, for tuning parameters in uh, neural networks, doing the random search is actually uh, often better than doing this grid layout. So the, really the crucial component here is that we assume that some parameters are unimportant. If we are tuning a support vector machine and we know gamma and C are the important ones and we definitely need to tune them, this is all probably not going to help us. But if we have a very complicated pipeline and the space is huge and probably the critical, um, the critical decisions are only a couple of these, then uh, this will help us. So it helps because we can get away with searching over less values? Okay, the question is, it helps us get away by searching over less values. So I think another way to look at it is, is here, the budget is decoupled from the dimensionality of the search space. So basically, if I want three values in this first example, if I want for each parameter I want three values, then uh, I have nine values in total. If I add two more dimensions, I would have to have, uh, what, uh, 81 uh, points to get three values each. Um, with the random layout, I can just say, I want this and this many iterations. I can sample this many points, and it's independent of how many parameters I have. And I will get, uh, if I do 91 runs, I will get 91 different parameters, uh, 91 different settings for each of the parameters. So it's actually, I get more parameter settings for each of the parameters. Um, but um, basically, I'm not looking at all possible combinations. How do you do the x and y axis for the dimensionality? Well, these functions here, so assume there's a function on this 2D space, and these are the marginals. So the, the, assume the function is flat on this axis and is this guy on this axis. So maybe a 3D plot would have been nicer here. I'm not sure. But this is the, the figure from the original paper that's usually used. Um, maybe we can come up with a more didactic one. So here's an example of how to do this with uh, scikit-learn. So as you might have seen, there's the randomized search CV, which is basically a drop-in replacement for grid search CV. Um, the one difference is that in, you can specify lists as we usually did with uh, grid search CV, but you can also specify distributions. So here I'm searching for, um, okay, I didn't include the definition of CLF, but CLF is a random forest, as you might have figured from the um, parameters here. And so here for some of the parameters I specified as lists, and some of the parameters are specified as distributions. And here, distributions can be anything that has, is an object with an RVS method. 
Um, this is just the interface that distributions have in uh, scipy.stats, but you can also write your own. And so here, uh, for example, max features is drawn randomly from 1 to 11, and min sample split is drawn randomly from 2 to 11. Here for these um, integer parameters, using the uniform integer distribution is not that crucial. If you have continuous parameters, really to get this benefit that was sort of uh, shown here, uh, you need to use the continuous distributions. So basically, instead of discretizing um, my <coughs> uh, parameter C and gamma or uh, my alpha parameter, uh, I use a continuous distribution. And so I can always just sample more points and I get more resolution. So um, it also means that I can kind of stop at any point. So let's say I uh, want to uh, tune my parameter C of my logistic regression. And if I define a grid, I have to st uh, run through all the points in the grid before I get a reasonable result. If I use randomized search, I could uh, run it for 10 iterations, and I don't if I don't like the results, I can just run it 100 more iterations. And if I get a good result at some point, I'll just stop. So I can just keep running longer, and I'll get uh, a better result. For grid search, you basically have to redefine a different grid if you want to run it again. All right. More questions about randomized search? So really, I think this is um, very useful is that if you're in high dimensions and you think not all of the parameters are crucial. Sorry, so if we specify distributions for the uh, parameters and then we know that uh, only a certain range of those values may, may have like way improved performance, instead of like letting it search through like all possible distribution values, is there a way that we can uh, give a distribution but just only in fine range of random values? Okay, the question is, uh, if we know that only certain range is important, uh, can we specify just a certain range? And, and this is sort of, you can usually de de define that in the distribution. So you could define a distribution that is just over this range, right? So like. So, but for a continuous distribution, it's always from like negative infinity to other infinity of possible values, right? No. Okay. I mean, you can use a uniform distribution uh, between zero and one or between zero and 10, or you can do like, a gamma distribution between whatever I, you want, or you, you can do, um, so the most common one is uniform and um, log uniform, because like a C and gamma, you probably want log uniform distributions. But you can definitely uh, pick the bounds for these. All right, so I mean, what you can see here in this interface, maybe I should have pointed this out uh, more concretely, is you have this n eater, which basically says, Whoops. That uh, this is how many samples I would get. In a random search, you, there is no, uh, sorry, in a grid search, there is no n eater. In a grid search, it tries out all combinations. In this case here, I just say I run for 200 iterations, if, but, uh, but the total sp uh, space size here is 2 times 2 times 9 times 10, which I'm not going to compute now. It's bigger than 200. All right. So this is um, sort of the first way to get away from randomized search. But this is still sort of pretty stupid because um, it doesn't take into account the function values that we observed. Usually, if you want to optimize a function, if you find like a parameter worked well, usually you want to maybe try out similar parameters, right? It's not like you independently try all try everywhere, if you find something that works well, you would try to find something similar that uh, hopefully improves. So um, you could try to use like simplex method or gradient-based methods on, uh, on this, um, which are sort of standard optimization techniques, but they don't really work well because, um, as I said, the function is very expensive to optimize and it might be like very like uh, non-continuous or very weird. 
So there's another method that is uh, commonly used, which is called uh, Bayesian optimization, or also um, SMBO, which stands for sequential model-based optimization. The main idea here is that we fit a cheap probabilistic function to our black box function. So we have f, which is our black box function, which is trying a neural network for a week. And then we get one output, which is the accuracy. So instead of trying to optimize this function directly, we um, get a surrogate function, we build a surrogate function, basically doing like a regression problem that tries to predict, given the parameter setting, how well will the model perform. And then we try to uh, optimize this surrogate function. Um, of course, to, to build the surrogate function, we need actual outcomes. And so uh, we still need to evaluate our original function and we get a loop that is, we evaluate our original function, then we fit our um, surrogate function, it tries to fit the very expensive function, then we try to optimize the surrogate function, we pick the best point of the surrogate function, and then we evaluate it using the expensive function. There's one more detail, or it's actually quite important, which is, um, so we usually we want to trade off exploration and exploitation. So we don't necessarily want to find the optimum of our surrogate function, but we want to uh, try out places where there might be a good optimum. So the surrogate function that we use are usually probabilistic functions that give us some way to specify uncertainty. So if you look at this first picture here, so let's say we have only one continuous hyperparameter and um, excuse me, the true uh, objective is the dotted black function, but it's very expensive to optimize. And so let's say we already have evaluated it twice, here and here. Then we fit our surrogate model, <coughs> which is the black line. And uh, this model also has um, an uncertainty. So here is the posterior uh, mean plus minus standard deviation. So that's sort of this purple gray area. So where we observe the points, this, uh, we are very certain what the value is. But if we go away from the points that we observe, we're very uncertain. And so, uh, but we hope that we have a good model uh, of the uncertainty and so the true objective will mostly lie within these bounds. Now what we can do is um, there's several different criteria to trade off this exploration exploitation. Um, one of them is called um, expected improvement, which is very common, but the more general, generally this is called the acquisition function, which you can see in green here. So in this case here, it's, I think it's expected improvement, where basically um, the problem is to minimize it, so we want to find the minimum of the dotted line. And so, um, okay, actually I'm not sure, this is not actually expected improvement, I think, but basically it's a combination of uh, where we think the minimum currently is and the uncertainty. And so here the acquisition function uh, is often something like um, the lo lowest point, so um, mean minus, minus the standard deviation, which would be um, he here in this case. So here we're using a different function. Um, but so this fu uh, acquisition function trades off uncertainty um, versus low function value and it says, okay, so um, I think trying out the point here will give, us, will give us information about the underlying function. And so then we can feed this into our expensive uh, function, uh, that's the dotted line. We train our neural network and this is the outcome. And so now we have this observation X3, which says this is the function value at this point. Now we can retrain our surrogate function, the solid line. And we can also get the new um, standard deviation. 
And this will lead to a new acquisition function, the new green line here. Now we can optimize this green line and we can say, oh, this is the point that looks most promising. And then I'll use this most promising point, evaluate the most expensive function and iterate. Wait, actually, never mind. It was a maximization problem. That's why it, okay. It tries to find the maximum. So basically it always proposes the maximum of the, the purple gray area. So the maximum was here. Then it observed it, figured out that the value was actually lower. Then it figured out the maximum. Um, it tried, figured out the bound was here. And so it uh, tried out here and so on. So iteratively we get a better and better model of the underlying um, function with our surrogate and we get closer and closer to the optimum. Um, so, may, so what we are doing here is we're trading off optimizing the dotted line which is very hard to evaluate versus optimizing basically the green line at the bottom. And the green line at the bottom is something that we control. It's like usually it's a Gaussian process uh, which is like a probabilistic regression model. And so we can optimize that using some gradient-based methods, or we can do a random search on this, which is much, much faster than training a neural network. Questions about the general idea? So your solid line is your initial, I guess, input set to the yes. Okay, so there's many different acquisition functions. So I, I, I was confused here for a second because I thought it was minimization and maximization. So here in this case, basically, you look at um, the function value plus the standard deviation at that point, and you get the maximum of that. That's um, upper confidence bound, basically. So you look at the maximum of the purple, um, of the purple contour. So that's a point where you think it might be possible that there's a good value here. The purple is the standard deviation. Okay, and then your solid line is the actual... Is value. the mean, yes. Yeah. And so you look at, um, if I look at the mean plus the standard deviation, which is the, the purple contour, is the mean plus the standard deviation. If this is high, this is, it, it's possible that there's a good point here. Uh, so the combination of the, of the mean estimation and the uncertainty sa tells me maybe there's something good here, I'm not entirely sure. So then I try out this point and then I will get more certain. And then I'll either know, oh, there was, uh, it was not a good value and then the uncertainty is reduced, as you can see here, or it is a good value and then I'm more certain. So you need to have a model that can give you the standard deviation um, with the regression fit. So I'm gonna talk about some of these models uh, next, but so as I said, very commonly Gaussian processes are used and basically the, the model just provides you not only with the mean prediction, but also with standard deviation of the data. But so if you just had um, a standard regression function, you wouldn't get that. So there's, um, actually there's, Here's a list of three things that people used. Actually, there's a fourth now that I haven't put on here yet. So there's Gaussian processes, which is sort of the standard that most people used. Um, random forests, so you can do random forest regression. Um, you can also, so the question is then, how do you get the, the standard deviation out of the random forest? But um, you, could, you can get standard deviations out of the leaves of the tree of the trees, and if you are careful in how you build your forest, these are actually useful. And there's another method called um, a non-parametric um, uh, tree parsing estimate, um, which is like, I'm not gonna explain, uh, but it's sort of a, a, a different method that was used before. And the fourth method that's missing here is neural networks. So people have extended neural networks in um, ways that allow you to make um, 
uncertainty predictions. So basically that your prediction is also a Gaussian, so we have mean standard deviation. Usually if you would use a neural network for regression, it will just give you a regression value. But there are several extensions that allow you to also get a standard deviation. And if you do that, then you can use, these, um, you can use it for this kind of model. So um, the biggest issue with the Gaussian processes is the scalability. They are sort of kernel methods. And so if you have like thousands or tens of thousands of observations, they basically they get very, very slow. Also, they have no way to deal with discrete parameters or conditional par parameters. But there's a bunch of implementations out there that's pretty tried and true. Um, the random forests. Um, there's actually, there's mostly one group that works on this. This is Frank Hutter's group, and they created the SMAC. Um, the implementation works very well with discrete parameters, with conditional parameters, and because it's a random forest, it's very scalable. Um, but there's sort of, it's, so their implementation works very well, but um, there's like a couple of tricks that they needed to make it work. Um, then the, the uh, tree person estimate um, actually also is, uh, pretty work, works pretty well for the conditional parameters, discrete parameters, and it's actually reasonably scalable, but um, yeah, I, I think there's only one implementation out there and that's not maintained. So it's kind of tricky to use from a practical standpoint. And um, Okay, so let me actually, yeah, so this is actually the implementations. Um, so SMAC is the reinforced model of uh, Hutter's group. There's one that was used in the neural network community quite a lot um, called Spearmint uh, by a group of uh, uh, Snook et al. And uh, they actually spun it up into a startup at some point and then got bought by Twitter and was a whole thing. Um, so they, but the implementation still exists. It's uh, GP based and it's still pretty good for neural networks. Hyperopt is the one uh, for tree parsing estimates that's uh, not maintained anymore, was done by Bergstra, was very good when it existed, but now they don't have Python 3 support, for example, and it's just, it doesn't work with modern, modern NumPy and so on. Um, there's Scikit Optimize, which is a library that's like co more community maintained. And there's implementations using a Gaussian process, uh, random forests, and uh, gra gradient boosting, and some other things. Um, and that works reasonably well. It's not super mature, I think. And there's uh, GPyopt, which is based on GPs, um, so Gaussian processes, based on the GPy Gaussian process library. It's done from, um, this is from Neil Lawrence Group in Edinburgh. No, not in Edinburgh. Oh my God. Anyway, in the UK, I'm blanking on all the things today. Um, why did I think? Anyway, so, uh, they have done Gaussian processes for many years, and they're basically the, the group in the world that is, knows best how to code up Gaussian processes. So this GPI, wor uh, this GPI op works pretty well if for like given the trade-offs of using Gaussian processes. All right, so this has been done for like probably like 10 years now and people use these kind of methods for doing tuning um, both of like machine learning pipelines but also tuning of uh, neural networks. And uh, actually, so if you look at the, the tutorial um, video from uh, Neurips, um, Frank says that he talked with one of the people um, that worked on uh, AlphaGo Zero and they said, well, of course we use this to tune AlphaGo zero. Um, AlphaGo would never be as good, so good if we, did, if we had to manually pick all the hyperparameters, we run it through this. And so um, there's so many different ways that you can uh, tune your neural architecture. Doing this manually is just not feasible, in particular if you have a lot of computation like uh, Google has, then um, running these methods and doing the search automatically can speed up things. Um, but uh, well, th there's, um, there's been some criticism. 
which is um, here um, shown. This is for not doing neural architectures, uh, but for doing um, sort of standard machine learning on several data sets. And so here is SMAC, which is sort of considered state of the art, and TPE, which is also not too bad, and uh, compared against uh, random search. And you can see that, so this is on 117 data sets, uh, the average rank of the best model found um, by each of these algorithms after a certain amount of time. And so lower is better. And you can see that um, SMEC and TPE are pretty similar. TPE actually does a little bit better here. And um, they both be doing random search. But actually, if you do random search times two, which is I just run random search as t at twice the speed, then you would, um, then you see that actually beats uh, both of these algorithms. So what, what does random search at twice the speed mean? It's just like every time you allow SMEC to run, you allow random search to run twice. Uh, why is this an interesting comparison? Because SMEC and TPE are usually sequential algorithms. So if you just run uh, two computers at the same time, uh, like with random search, which is like embarrassingly parallel, you'll just beat the smarter methods. And um, if you look at uh, what they converge to, here this is test error on s some of the data sets. And um, uh, uh, after a given budget of time, and you can see that, well, yeah, okay, um, the, these smart methods, maybe I performed randomized search on um, some of these, but not on all of these. And uh, the, the difference is certainly small. So it's not quick. So these methods are like pretty complex, um, require a bunch of math, hard to implement, and maybe they're not better than random search after all. Uh, and particularly, like the theory, in a sense, says it's impossible to be better than random search in general. You could say like, okay, we hope we're lucky and these functions actually be behave nicely. If they be behave nicely, then um, the methods would help us. Um, there's another comparison here um, where it actually uh, compares like lots of different algorithms. Um, and on, this is now for uh, neural networks on three data sets. And you can see that um, basically running random search at twice the speed is pretty competitive with all of the, um, all of the state of the art methods, except for hyperband, which is the thing I'm gonna talk about next. Um, th there's a very interesting, this is from a blog post by uh, uh, Ben Recht. Um, from 2016, as you can see. And so basically he says, well, all this Bayesian optimization, it's actually theoretically impossible. Why do you bother? He's a very opinionated guy, but uh, like usually his opinion are uh, very worth considering. Um, so it's a very interesting article to read. And a bunch of things happened since 2016, but uh, not that many. All right, so what do we do if we say, well, all these method, fancy methods, they're not really better than random search. And actually, um, the theory says you can't really be better than random search in general if you look at this black box model. Well, the natural idea is to go beyond this black box model. So instead of just saying, well, we have this arbitrary, very complicated, very expensive function, we, we know a couple of things about this function that we could maybe exploit. So there's a couple of families uh, of methods that I wanna talk about. Um, one that I'm actually not gonna talk about is hyperparameter gradient descent. So if your model is differentiable, then, uh, sorry, if computing the performance is differentiable, then you can do gradient descent on the hyperparameters. So basically the idea is if you can get a gradient through, to, through all your computations here, then you can uh, actually use gradient-based optimization, which is gonna be much faster. Um, the things I wanna talk about more is um, what's called multi-fidelity optimization and meta-learning. 
There's several other things, and if you yeah, go back to the tutorial by uh, Frank and Joaquin, then you'll see all of their amazing work that they've done. But I think the multi-fidelity optimization and meta-learning are really things where um, things become practical and people use them. So let's talk about the multi-fidelity first. The idea of multi-fidelity is to approximate your very expensive function by a similar function that's cheaper. Um, so for example, instead of training your neural network for a week, you could just train it for an hour and see which parameters work well. Or here are two examples from scikit-learn. Um, oh, so the top is um, doing RBF, uh, SBM, so we have a C and a gamma parameter, and we do, I'm not sure if you can read this, different fraction of the data. So this is on 10% of the data on the digits data set, 20% of the data, 40% of the data, 80% of the data. So here, every time I double the data, and you can see that actually um, the hyperparameters that are good don't, don't change that much. Um, so I can very early on exclude a lot of the hyperparameters for being bad. And if I use 20% of the data, the optimum is basically at the same place as if I use 80% of the data. <coughs> and so here, I'm replacing the expensive function, evaluate the SVM, trying to evaluate the SVM with a cheaper function um, train evaluate the SVM on a subset of the data. And because uh, SVMs take about quadratic to cubic time to train, it's actually much, much faster to train on a subsample data set. Um, the second example here is um, random forest. So here I'm tuning random forest, and I have the maximum depth and maximum feature values. and here, I'm not subsampling the data set. I'm constraining the number of trees I, can, uh, I, I grow. So the first plot is just using 10 trees, then 40 trees, 80 trees, and 160 trees. And oh yeah, so here, oh, I have just the, the times also. So here, we went from two seconds to five seconds to 20 seconds to 67 seconds. So if we do 20% uh, of the data, we are 10 times faster than 80% of the data or more than actually 12 times faster, but we still get uh, basically good enough uh, optimization results for the parameters. Here for the random forest, the speed up is um, only linear, but for example, if I look at um, using 40 trees, we, still, we already get a pretty good idea of where the good parameters are. I think the optimum is here, and this optimum doesn't change between 40 trees and 160 trees. So I can again approximate this function by um, of how good will the full model be by evaluating how good will a partial model be. And the other example that I mentioned is for iterative algorithms like neural networks, you can just run it for a short period of time. So instead of doing uh, 100,000 iterations, do 10,000 iterations and um, see which parameter wor values worked well. All right, so what are we gonna do with this now? So we have the original function we want to optimize, and we have several other functions that sort of are better and better approximations of the true function, but they are che cheaper to evaluate. Um, so I think what people actually did, did first was what's called multi-fidelity Bayesian optimization. And so they tried to build a surrogate model again, but now they try to build a surrogate model that gets both the function, you estimate both the function value and the time it would take to evaluate this specific function. So if you have a family of functions, say, a different subsamples of the data set. And um, so now we can use a similar acquisition function that we did use before, but we can trade off uh, how long do I have to wait to evaluate this versus how much information will it give me. So it's very natural that in the beginning, when you have very little information, um, so if I start with a blank slate, just running this will give me a lot of information. But then maybe as I wanna hone in more to uh, uh, more precise parameters, I wanna be more and more accurate and use more computation power to be more accurate. And so you could use this Bayesian optimization framework to do this sort of automatically, have the algorithm automatically trade off with the uncertainty versus 
um, how long I have to wait. Um, this is actually, I mean, this has, this actually works uh, okay. It has um, the downside of being like kind of tricky to, to implement and there's th many choices you have to make. Um, actually, yeah, so I m made some comments here around how this compares to bandits, but given how that we don't have that much time, I'm not going to talk about bandits. Um, I'm going to talk about a way, way easier way to use this, which is actually very uh, popular these days, which is called successive halving. So, so let's say we have different, um, we have these different functions that are differently expensive and um, we want to use them to find the optimum. The way successive halving works is just in each step, you uh, eliminate the worst half of your configurations and you keep the best half. That's why it's called halving. Actually, now it's recommended to do to divide by three every time, um, but because the theory says three is better than two, but I'll use the words of using two and half of each iteration. So you're given like n configurations, so n different pipelines or n different hyperparameter configurations, um, and the budget B, which is how much time you want to spend. And so at each iteration, you keep the best half of the configurations. So you start with like, say, a small subset of your data. You compute the best, you compute the scores, you keep the best half of the uh, configurations, and then you double the amount of compute that you give all of them. So you, each time you have the configurations, but you double the amount of compute. And you do this in a way so that you never run over your uh, total budget. So you, at the beginning, you specify a total budget that you don't want to run over. And um, so if you do um, uh, lock eta n uh, iterations of this, so eta is two or three and n is the number of configurations, then you're left with a single configuration. So this is sort of intuitive. You start with the cheapest function and you, th you um, go to the more expensive function, you throw out half of the uh, space half of the configurations every time. There's a, also, so I tried to write it down in a nice way. This is how it's written down in the paper. And uh, I find it's a little bit harder to read uh, because they get, have all these rounding operations to get the right integers. Um, so instead I wanna show you um, a quick calculation example. So let's say you have uh, 81 configurations so you have nine values of C, nine values of gamma, say, and you say, oh, I have a total budget of 20,000, which means I only want to use 20,000 training examples in total. That's like a really a little bit of a weird way to think about it, but uh, that's how you do have to specify it for this algorithm. So in the first iteration, you would use all 81, con all 81 configurations of parameters, but only give them, say, uh, 41 samples. You do a very small subsample of the data. Then you kick out the worst, so here I'm using the, the three, so I kick out the worst two thirds of my um, configuration space, so I, uh, I keep 20 second configurations, and I triple the resources. So now I have uh, nine, uh, 27 configurations, I train on 123 samples each. Then I do this again, I uh, keep the best third of the configurations, I triple the budget, and um, and so on, and then after one, two, three, four, five iterations, I have only one iteration, uh, only one configuration left, and this is the best iteration, the best configuration. And so here, the way this was calculated by the algorithm, I was under my, uh, the total budget I spent was under the, um, uh, under the total budget limit I gave in the beginning. And uh, so basically the reason why we do both the t um, increasing the um, increasing the capacity exponentially and dividing the space ex exponentially is that if you do it this way, uh, basically 
you're only um, like a constant fraction slower than if you just ran the last iteration. So basically, the last iteration takes um, the same time as all the iterations before together, right? This is summed up. Okay, but then, for example, if I use, like, if I cut half of the samples or cut half of the configuration, I will definitely run less uh, iteration versus if I only cut by a third, right? So then, does it matter, like, if if I cut more in each step, which reduces the level of iteration that I need to run, which also impacts the total budget, right? So, in the I'm not sure if I get it. If you use the three, you keep only the best third. So you're more aggressive than if you do the two. And then you have oh, less yeah, iterations. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I mean, like, uh, the number of configuration that you need to eliminate uh, affects the number of iterations yes. that you have to run, right? Which ultimately influence your total resource configuration. So yeah. I guess you have to, so the total budget is the sum, so you have to, I guess, so, so the algorithm figures out, given, you give the algorithm your total budget, your number of configurations, and whether you want two or three, and it gives you this, this thing. Oh, so it will figure out how It will figure out, yeah. Okay. So th this is sort of, uh, and it's like very, it's very simple. It's basically, I mean, it looks kind of ugly here if you, if you look at the formulas, but it's really, it's pretty straightforward. The algorithm uh, tells you uh, how to go allocate these so that you don't uh, run under your total budget. The hard thing is a little bit more to specify what is your total budget. Of course, it's usually not that natural to think about, or I haven't understood yet how to think about it, maybe. Um, so here, here's another example. Um, I think I stole this from, oh, from uh, Matthias' chapter in the book that I mentioned. Um, this is sort of, what you get as the result. So here we only have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight configurations. And um, so here, this is what successive halving uh, would do on eight configurations. So here, um, you first used, I guess, like an, uh, an eighth of the budget or something like this, and you got um, the loss of each of the configurations. You ke kept the best four, so he, use a factor of two here. So then we train these more for, or with um, a higher budget, we get these values, we keep two best, we uh, increase the budget again, and then we keep only the last one. And so this way you use, of course, vastly less resources than um, what you would uh, do if you expanded all of these. And so this speeds up compared to grid search, like, a whole lot. Um, one sort of issue with this here is that you have to specify um, the number of configurations ahead of time. And so given a given, like, let's say you have, I don't know, a day on like um, one big computer, it's unclear whether you should try to sample a lot of different uh, parameter values and then make it prune them very aggressively, or if you should um, sample only a few candidates and then give each of these candidates more time. So basically, how do you specify the budget and how do you specify the number of parameters um, that you put in? And um, so there's, an extension of this um, that tries to tries to solve this issue, which is called a uh, hyperband, and I cut off the graph. Then, anyway, uh, so hyperband basically runs multiple iterations of successive halving. In the first one, it um, so it uses a distribution over configurations, like random search did. So in the first one, I sample lots of configurations. And then I prune them very aggressively. In the second one, I uh, sample <coughs> fewer and then prune less aggressively and so on. And um, they have some nice theoretical results that show 
that um, th this is actually an effective uh, method to choose the budget. And so basically this is just um, iteratively trying to do the successive halving with different budgets. And this got like uh, a lot of attention. Uh, this was actually also what was described in the blog post I uh, showed earlier. And people are like um, really excited about this. And, it's, and I think uh, for good reasons, this looks very promising. So here is the, um, the code for this. And basically, there's another like interesting logs and exps and rounding and so on. So you get exactly the right budget to run at each duration to make the convergence proofs work. But it's, again, it's, like, it's actually pretty straightforward if you look at the numbers. All right, so we, we opened the, the, up the, the black box and we ha now use, have this family of sort of cheaper to evaluate function that approximate um, our original expensive function. But um, we also sort of lost something because when we did this Bayesian optimization, we actually, we used uh, the input space, we use the similarity between the different parameters. Here, we treat each of these candidates as completely independent from the other candidates. So, Hyperband doesn't know like if you changed your parameter C a little bit, but everything else is the same. It treats each configuration as a separate configuration and basically raises it against the other configurations. It doesn't know anything about the parameter space. And so, um, there's an extension uh, of this called um, BOHB, or uh, I don't know how to pronounce this, HP Banster. I'm not sure if it's Hipster Banster or Hyper Banster. Um, and the goal of this is to, to combine the uh, benefits of doing this kind of successive halving or this um, uh, hyperband with Bayesian optimization. So B it's Bayesian optimization with hyperband, I think. Um, and so here, this is uh, a plot from, from their paper, which shows that, um, so here we have random search, which is sort of our baseline. You have TPE, which is sort of a Bayesian optimization method that works well. And you, in green, you have hyperband. And in purple, you have uh, BOHB, which is their method. Obviously, never trust anyone's plot in their paper about their method. Um, obviously, you can only publish it if your method wins. So, but I think it's still sort of instructional. Um, so the point here is that if you do random search and compare it to Bayesian optimization, in the beginning, random search and Bayesian optimization are very close because uh, Bayesian optimization needs to gather a lot of information before it can be effective. It, you need to, to try a lot of points before you can build a good model of your function. Once you have a good model of your function, you can zone it into your optimum. And so here you can see that, um, so this is actually, uh, I think this is computation time. So uh, here you can see that at the tail end, um, so regret is like loss, roughly. Um, at the tail end, uh, the Bayesian optimization works better than random search, but in the beginning, it's basically the same. Then if you, if you look at hyperband versus random search, hyperband in the beginning is much, much faster than random search, but then in the end, it's about the same speed. And so what they're trying to do with the uh, BOHP is basically in the beginning, you run hyperband, so in the beginning you get the initial speed out of running hyperband, but then in the end you run Bayesian optimization, so as you get close to the optimum, you can use the Bayesian optimization techniques uh, to get a good model. And yeah, um, so this looks pretty promising, but of course, again, this is like, this is much, much harder to implement than just doing the, um, hyperband. So just doing the hyperband or successive halving um, is like super imp simple to implement. 
because you don't need to have any, any uh, build any fancy Bayesian optimization model. All right, so in practice, um, so I highly encourage you to read the hyperband paper. Uh, there's a journal version of the paper, which I put up here. And what I say is, with the exception of the linear experience uh, experiment and the 117 data set experiment, the most aggressive bracket of successful halving outperformed hyperband in all of our experiments. So what they're saying is, um, actually just doing successive halving was better than doing hyperband if you have the correct settings of the specific halving parameter. If you set the budget well, you don't need to do the fancy hyperband. Um, and this is the hyperband paper. So if they're criticizing hyperband, you should, you should listen up. Um, so I mean, they argue, well, we don't, we don't really know which, um, which how, to, how to set the budget for the successive halving which is the point of hyperband, but maybe this shows that there's like, there's probably some simple, simple way to do this that is not hyperband that you can uh, just use successive halving. And so now for, in practice, it might be that just doing successive halving is enough. And successive halving is basically, is like three lines of Python. Cool, and so if you want to use this, um, hopefully soon we'll have it in scikit-learn. Here I gave you a link to the discussion thread. There's um, the HP Banster. Is uh, this is done by the group that published this BOHB. It's a distributed implementation. So if you want to run it, it's not really a drop-in replacement for grid search CV, but it's done more for neural network training. So you can do this like on a cluster with a like, multi-GPU and everything. And if you want to train a big neural network, it's probably a good idea. If you want to uh, just speed up your grid search, it might be a bit cumbersome. Um, but it's probably not, not that hard to do. There's Scikit Hyperband. There's a couple of other implementations of Hyperband um, that are compatible with Scikit-Learn. Um, I ha haven't found one that does the subsampling trick built in. You, you can do this very easily yourself, but for example, a Scikit Hyperband, you could immediately use that with random forests. And so it will like, lose, le use less trees in the beginning and use more trees in the end. And so this is basically a drop-in replacement for um, grid search CV. Why is my battery low when I'm plugged in? So, sorry. I'll get your question when my computer sh doesn't shut down. No, no, there's no, I, I, I just haven't finished arguing to put it in scikit-learn. I think it would still, like, if you can just replace your grid search CV input with a different input, uh, import, and it's 100 times faster, th that would be valuable, right? So, no, it's just, uh, I mean, what I'm saying is more, don't wait for us to do it, you can just do it yourself until we fix it. Um, or you can use one of the other implementations. Um, yeah, so scikit hyperband, you can already use, uh, there's other implementations, and if you don't want to use hyperband, just successive halving, um, yeah, just implement it yourself uh, in a couple of lines. Or, yeah, hopefully in like the next, or in two, probably more in two versions of scikit-learn, we'll have it. Well, I was really concerned that this lecture will be too short. Um, I guess I was talking too much or didn't drink enough coffee. So th the last thing I want to talk about is meta-learning. So maybe you remember, we, we started with this black box thing. We said black box is not enough. Then we did multi-fidelity. And uh, the other option was meta-learning. So meta-learning is learning from experience, where experience means other data sets. So, this is also pretty promising because this is sort of 
how we imagine um, humans might do this, they learn from experience. And so it's called meta-learning because now um, the data sets are samples and the configure the wait, yeah, okay. And the targets are configurations, basically. So each data set is a sample to learn on uh, about the configurations. So that's kind of interesting. So I want to start with some very simple ideas that uh, how we can do meta learning or what could we gain from using other data sets. So the assumption is we have a big um, array of data sets. We have like 100 data sets that are representative of all the data sets we'll ever see. That's actually quite hard to accomplish, but imagine we have that. All right, the first thing we could do is we could check which are the algorithms that are best on average. So you run all your algorithms on a large array of data sets and then rank by the best on average. Um, one issue here is that run many algorithms, um, if you want to tune them all optimally, if you do the tune them with grid search, it's gonna take forever. So ideally, you'd probably use one of the smart techniques we just discussed to run the algorithms, uh, to find the best algorithm for each data set. So you use something smart, you find the best algorithm for each data set, and then you figure out which one is the best on average, which one is the second best on average, and so on, and you have a list of good classifiers to run. That's kind of na a natural thing to do, right? This is sort of how a human would learn what are good models. Um, again, it's a little bit smarter, uh, it's implemented in, there's an interesting paper in implementation, Posh Auto SK Learn, um, that does it um, uh, so that you create a diverse set so that you have probably a good model in the top K. So, let, so that's different than having the best 10 models. You, um, the, the best model and the second best model are probably very similar, but you want, let's say, a group of 10 models so that on all your data set, uh, one good one is in this 10. That's sort of a different problem. That's actually like a submodel optimization problem that you can sort of, actually solving it is hard, but you can get a decent approximation. And so you could get this portfolio in a, and you can um, pick a portfolio that um, is relatively small and that one of, that for each data set, there's a good algorithm in there or good enough. And so now instead of running a grid search over all my pipelines, I selected like a portfolio of 100 pipelines and um, I picked them in such a way that there's always, for each data set, a good enough pipeline is in this portfolio. And what Posh Auto Learn does, the, it, it stands for a portfolio, successive halving. Um, they create a portfolio and then they run successive halving on this portfolio. So they combine the, the meta learning of uh, creating the portfolio using other data sets with successive halving to select the best candidate from the portfolio for a new data set. And I think this is actually sort of the, the smartest, that's the smart thing we should probably be doing or one of the smart things we probably should be doing. Okay, I really have to speed up a little bit. Um, one thing that, um, A lot of people are sort of thinking about um, is if you do um, these um, hyperband, for example, you look at candidate configurations, and so in the Bayesian optimization, you look at continuous spaces of parameters. Does it matter if we look at a continuous space of parameters or if you uh, pick uh, discrete candidates? And some of the evidence says it doesn't really matter. Um, so maybe it's okay to build these portfolios and not actually optimize continuous parameters. Okay. The another method that is actually the one that uh, historically came first um, and also gave us the name meta learning is using meta features and meta models. So imagine you have many data sets. For each data set you find the best algorithm parameters, your best pipeline. And now you can um, try to build a model that predicts given a new data set, which one is the best parameters. To do this, you would have to express 
um, the properties of each, each data set as what's called meta features. So meta features could be something like number of samples, number of features, um, number of classes in classification, and any kind of statistics you could think of. And then you're trying to uh, predict, given these meta features, what is a good configuration for my new data set. This is sort of very direct translation of machine learning to the setting. Um, turns out it doesn't really work very well. Uh, it's very hard to find meta features that are informative enough. So instead, so instead of doing this, what uh, actually works better in practice is um, what's called active testing by some people and re recommendations by other people. And I want to point out this paper that I particularly like in probabilistic matrix factorization for AutoML. And so here, instead of looking at um, meta features, what we're doing is we're building a recommender system. In the recommender system, the users are data sets and like let's say the movies or the items that we want to recommend are the pipelines. And so you start trying out some pipelines on the data set and if something works well or doesn't work well, you look at other data sets and ask on these other data sets, which algorithms worked well, which algorithms didn't work well. And so you compute similarity by how well the algorithms work. As you ask like Netflix compare similarity between you and your roommate by which movies you like. And so this way we get around just trying to, or having to identify meta features and we just uh, look at um, basically similar uh, data sets and those where similar algorithms work well and then this allows us to suggest new algorithms that work even better. Um, and this paper here it has like a bunch of cool graphs so if you do this uh, recommendation uh, algorithm, you get a low dimensional embedding um, of basically all the pipelines, um, because that's how matrix factorization works. We're gonna talk about matrix factorization more after the sp spring break. And so they actually get sort of something that uh, the model itself doesn't know about different model models. So it does, doesn't know about different pipelines, it just knows here are these candidates, but the embedding actually figures out to differentiate between naive Bayes and random forest and XGBoost and linear discriminant analysis, which is quite interesting. And naive Bayes is, behaves very different from the random forest and XGBoost, and random forest and XGBoost they actually behave kind of similar. Well, th th but the point is the similarity here is measured by um, how well other pipelines perform. So you try out a bunch, let's say you try out a bunch at random or you use the ranking. You, um, so basically, uh, you, Netflix would start by giving you the most popular movies, right? And then it looks at which ones do you like and use this information to, to recommend new ones. So here, you start with the pipelines that work well across many data sets. You look at how well they perform and how well they perform allows you to compare with other data sets. And so if on your new data set, uh, algorithm A performs good and algorithm B performs bad, I can look at other data sets where algorithm A performs good and algorithm B performs bad, and I look, what are other, uh, what are other algorithms that work well on the, uh, historically on this kind of data sets? Exactly. The similarity is not like direct characteristics of data sets, it's uh, in terms of which algorithms work well. And so, yeah, so this is sort of um, how, this is basically like context-free recommendations in a sense. Um, okay, given that we have no time, I'm gonna skip the rest. Oh no, I don't wanna skip AutoSQLearn. Sorry for going over. AutoSQLearn is basically implementation of a lot of the things uh, that we talked about, it, um, what it does is it searches over a fixed scikit-learn pipeline. Um, it uses warm starting and meta features, um, and then does Bayesian optimization. So it combines a couple of the ideas that I talked about. And um, basically what it has is, um, you can see here, 
It has the auto escalon classifier and you can for fit and predict and it searches over like a giant amount of scikit-learn pipelines. And so, um, so this is pretty great. Um, maybe you ask yourself, why do I take this class if this does everything for me? Um, clearly this is not sort of um, perfect yet, but it's um, quite interesting already. One of the things that uh, I think is a little bit of an issue is that, so here this is an example from the website and they run on a digits data set and it takes about an hour before it gives you any result on a digits data set. Ideally, you would get re some results more quickly. But uh, if you're very patient or you just wanna run it overnight, you can run this and we'll probably give you um, a, a good, like a, a decent pipeline. All right, so to wrap up, so um, in practice, I think this multi-fidelity and Bayesian, this um, successive halving is something that will be very helpful. Um, looking at portfolios will probably be helpful. The, uh, if you have um, very large computation, HP Bandster will help in auto SK learn. Um, the using collaborative filtering is probably something that will be more helpful in the, in the future. Um, finally, to wrap up with criticism, because other people want to give a lecture here, uh, this is from the Posh Auto Escalon paper that builds these portfolios and then a successive halfing, and uh, they find, in the end, basically they only need XGBoost. They, 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 they search over all of scikit-learn in like very complex combinations, and they find out, oh, actually, if you just use XGBoost, it's fine. All right. See you Wednesday.